People tell me that the American people don't want to listen to politicians, they have a very short attention span, uh, that they're not interested. I believe this is a conditioned response because nobody's been saying anything to them. I mean, you take some of the uh, p people over the last few years, uh, Ross Perot, Newt Gingrich, uh, Dick Gephardt, um, President Clinton. In my opinion, all they do is expound on the problems very eloquently, probably more eloquently than I about what the problems are. Ross Perot would put up his graphs and show the tremendous uh, inefficiencies of government absolutely correctly, but he never gave a solution. We can't continue to increase the tax burden on American citizens, hard-working American citizens, and expect that they're going to be happy about it. 27 percent of all of the manufacturing jobs that were lost in the country were lost in New York State. One state. 27 percent. Right now, we argue with one another. Right now, we're polarizing. The current bureaucratic system uh, wastes a lot of money. We don't object to spending the money, don't object to giving the money. We object to the fact that we feel we're getting ripped off. Something is wrong in America. Something has jammed, or some virus has infected our program. We who are blessed with energy and ideals, we who enjoy a robust economy and a government flush with our hard-earned tax money, we who have a creed in which neighbor helps neighbor and misfortune in a family or community spawns an Everest of aid, we consistently fail the needy among us. In the early 19th century, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, a French philosopher, came to America and was taken by what he saw. Um, he saw communities of people that helped each other, that showed compassion and love for each other, uh, that would, when somebody would move into the community, would go out and build the barn and help them. When they needed credit, it would be given with a handshake. He talked about how he met very few people who were not educated, very few people who couldn't read. And, one of the things that Alexis de Tocqueville said, that America is great because America is good. He didn't say it's because we have a wonderful economy or because our stock market was there because we have the strongest army in the world. Uh, it's our goodness that's going to get us through. And we need a system. People operate in systems. They operate in patterns. Uh, and we need a system that nurtures and nourishes those feelings and, and, and those emotions. Friends, today we will detail a solution. A solution to curb the inequities in our free market society. Capitalism has fed better, fed more, housed better, housed more, clothed better, clothed more than any system devised by man. It rewards risk-taking, breeds ambition and innovation, creates wealth and jobs. Yet capitalism has a downside. It polarizes wealth. It resembles a monopoly game play it long enough and one player ends up with all the money. This cycle can create a social explosion through the synergy of anger, fear, and pain. Capitalism carries no moral obligation to help the needy. Democracy does. This incompatibility has led people over the past 400 to 500 years to try and find a solution. America's has been to raise money through taxation, then distribute it through government programs. The problem is that what some government pays for, some bureau will control. When government becomes unaccountable, it becomes irresponsible. Ronald Reagan called a government agency the nearest thing on this earth to eternal life. Spending more money, we are getting less in return. My welfare experience is, I consider welfare right now, it's like road rage indoors. The demands of the welfare state have finally come head to head with uh, citizens' concerns about uh, the need to lower taxes and the need for less government. And I think the American people can look at these government programs at the national level and see that uh, the larger the bureaucracies have become, uh, the, uh, in fact, the spinoff effect has been that it has debilitated 
uh, people throughout the country. Anybody that's been in a Department of Motor Vehicles office or a welfare office can see the dramatic inefficiency, the waste of money, the long lines, the inconvenience, and just the poor way things are getting done, especially compared to the private sector. It's too much spending. It's, it's the, uh, the politicians think that it's their money to distribute as they want, as they see fit, and they're concerned more, much more about their own personal political future than they are about the people of New York. And that applies to the nation, too. I think the same thing is really happening in, in Washington. We are relying on the federal government and other levels of government to do things in the area of social services that could be better done through local organizations, local people being involved in the delivery of those services and the choice of those services. I don't think that any responsible person can take an objective look at the way our country is right now and say that any of this great society stuff has succeeded. One of the ways uh, that we try to explain why this doesn't work when government actually is the actual implementer of our programs, uh, we find a lot of truth in a, in a metaphor. Uh, we call it the wagon story. Think of this country's start as the beginning of a journey. To take it, we built a wagon called the United States of America. Its purpose was to carry the food, supplies, and tools we would need along the way. We made sure the wagon had room for our elderly, our very young, our sick and infirmed. Anyone was welcome who needed a ride. Our job was to push the wagon, Yet soon, we realized that we needed someone to steer. So we chose some to go up to the front and others to scout ahead for the best paths to follow. Those in the wagon appreciated the help. Those pushing were glad to aid their neighbors. Then something logical happened that on the surface appeared fine. The people steering the wagon found they were working only when the wagon had to change direction. Not content with that, they began to pull the wagon. As good an idea as that seemed, it actually began the process that undermined the mission's journey. As people in the front continued to pull, they became stronger. The more they pulled, the better they felt about themselves. Not so the people in back of the wagon, soon realizing that even if they stopped pushing, the wagon would still move. The people behind the wagon pushed less and less until they stopped pushing. After a while, the people pushing started walking instead. They weren't needed nor appreciated any longer. Once they had served their better angels by helping neighbor help neighbor, now they depended on the leaders in the front, remote, removed, and all important. Soon, one of the walkers noticed a spot on the wagon where they could jump aboard and hitch a ride. In time, everyone started fighting each other for the chance to jump aboard. As more climbed on, those in front found it harder to pull. Eventually, the wagon slowed down until finally it stopped. Looking back, the people in front saw a wagon filled with people who used to love and care for each other, now quarreling over a wagon that wasn't even moving. All this was caused by one act that seemed logical and good. In truth, it was the single biggest reason for the failure of every trip of this kind through history. The trip is democracy, and every one of them has failed. The average lifespan of a democracy historically has been 200 years. Each forgot that what matters is what we are, not just what we have. I 
something that government has taken carrying away from people. Absolutely. When we were in our communities and we knew Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith and we were willing to reach out and help the person, even with the meager existence that you had, there was a, a sense of community that was built that we passed on to our children. And as our children started doing better and had more to offer, they could give more. But government stepped in and said, wait a minute, we can do it for you. Give us the money and we'll distribute it. And we say, oh great, then I don't have to worry about it. Our government's been telling us for the last 50 years, don't care if your next door neighbor is out of work. Don't care if there's old people without health care. Don't care if there's people out there that can't afford shelter and food. Don't care if there's kids that aren't getting educated. Just pay your taxes and we will take care of it. And that's a very distorted message because it's not the way America is supposed to work. Well, you know, Americans uh, are very charitable in their giving huge quantities. And one of the interesting uh, studies I've seen about changes in charitable giving that were brought about by the federalization of welfare, that private donations for welfare purposes went down almost dollar for dollar with federal increases in expenditures during the early days of welfare. Government's failure is not because government is stupid or the people in government are stupid. It's not because there's not enough business people in government. It's not because it's corrupt and, or it's just uh, subjugated itself to special interests. Those are just symptoms of the problems. The reason government cannot implement is because it is not built to implement. Uh, in our book, we give nine, ten reasons why government cannot implement social programs. To give you a flavor of that, I'll give you one. Government was designed by our founding fathers to be very deliberate in anything it does. Uh, it was felt that any th decisions government makes are of such magnitude that they should be thought out very carefully, debated, all sides should be heard from before the decision is made, and it should be very resistant to, to change, very slow and resistant to change, which is good. That's the way government should be. When I've started four or five businesses in my life, I've done a lot of projects, and most people have started projects. I have never started one business or one project where I haven't made some mistakes in the beginning. And I think everybody has found that, whether you're knitting a sweater or you're starting a business or whatever. The success or failure of the project is going to be based on how fast you can recognize the problem and how fast you can address it and change it. So when you start a social security system, a health care system, an educational system, a food uh, stamp system, whatever, you're going to make mistakes. If you don't catch them quickly and change them, and sometimes you have to change them by trial and error to find the right way to do it. If you don't do that, you're doomed to failure. Government is an organization that is very, as we said, resistant to change. So what we have is a mismatch of the, go the, 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 the uh, basic nature of, of an entity and what it has to do. We've taken an entity that by its nature cannot change quickly and not, not address things quickly and put it in charge of programs that need dynamic change. But what I learned and what Shape is teaching me daily is you start wherever you are with whoever you're with, to start turning them around, and then there's this ripple effect that you're talking about right. and you're caring. These young people today, they're here because they care. These are the same children that were violent, disruptive, tearing up things, tearing up this community. Yet, they would take out of their day to come here to hear something that's going to inspire them to really care.